Now, a lot of things have changed since the filming and release of episode one. As you can see, we have a little bit of a different set. Um, we are here in the People's Security Bank Theater in Lackawanna College, and we, yeah, I don't even know where I'm going. <laughs> just keep rambling, just keep it going, I know. keep it going. I don't know why we'll I cut into like it. that. I get nervous. The Game Room is a production of Lackawanna College, serving students, graduates, and our surrounding communities since 1894. This episode is supported by Mountain Dew Amp Game Fuel. Learn more at GameFuel.com. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to episode two of The Game Room. I am Teddy Delaney. I'm Robert Eskra. And we are sitting here in our new temporary set in the People's Security Bank Theater here on the campus of Lackawanna College. Uh, a couple things have changed since the uh, filming and release of our first episode, obviously the new set. Um, we have some some new equipment. We have some new events to talk about. And we some new knickknacks. Yes, as you can see here, we- uh, <laughs> Give me them tchotchkes. <laughs> yeah, trust me, all of this stuff. Uh, we own, none of it is our children's, um, don't judge me. Um, so yeah, we're gonna start <laughs> off uh, the podcast, just like we start off every podcast with the patch notes. All right, on this week's patch notes, we wanted to cover a couple things that happened over the summer. First and foremost, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, Carball Association, the College Carball Association Summer Series. Um, we had three top tier teams come out on top. First place, we had LSU beating USF in five games out of a best of seven. We had USF coming out on top of Akron in second place, beating them in four games out of a best of seven. And then Akron, who actually beat Nebraska in a best of seven, they took it to five games. But ultimately, LSU came out on top. Again, these watching some of these plays is absolutely insane. I, I always say it every time that Rocket League, first of all, is just one of the most mesmerizing games to watch. I can't play it. I am awful at it, but yeah, I we love just, watching it. We just talked play. about it a little bit, and um, actually a student of mine were just talking about it. Uh, my, myself, I'm only plat two, maybe plat three. He was saying that he's plat two as well. But some of these kids in, in Grand Champ are just literally in the air at all times. I don't think their wheels touch the ground more than 20 seconds a match. No, that's great. And I, I love it because it's the Collegiate Car Ball Association, but they should call it Plane Ball Association. Yeah, exactly. That's a bad joke. I yeah. apologize for no, that. No, that's okay. They, I mean, they're flying around all over the place. What can you do? Um, so yeah, moving on, I wanted to talk about the summer camps that we held here at Lackawanna College. Um, we had about 30, 35 kids come out to our Fortnite camp, Minecraft camp, and it was absolutely awesome to be in a room with all these little kids and these fresh minds learning how to build in Minecraft, you know, playing with each other, um, figuring out how to survive in the crazy survival world of Minecraft. Man, I tell you what, I was born in the wrong generation. If I could have gone to summer camp to play Minecraft, played Rocket League, played Fortnite, yeah. um, First of all, I don't think my mom would have let me. No. But this this generation, it, it just goes to show that um, parents are willing to let their kids excel at, especially uh, now that this is becoming such a prevalent thing in today's society. Which Absolutely. Is awesome. And I mean, it, it goes without saying that there's more than just playing these games in the, in these summer camps. You know, they they learn how to work together. They learn team working skills, uh, team building. They they uh, critically think and strategize. You know, I mean, Minecraft's a pretty simple game, but to figure out the ins and outs and how to survive and what to build and what resources you need and where to mine, and that's what we taught them. But it compels creativity and it compels hand-eye coordination. There are plenty of studies that show that you know, gaming in the right environment, used the right way, it absolutely aids in development. Uh, raise as grades as long as it's it's not something that they're doing 20 hours a day which we don't suggest at all mm -hmm. um, but it's it's with a, a structured camp such as this such as that we've been doing here at the school um, it's it's just great for these kids yeah absolutely and they got to take home a copy of the game I opened up a realm for them so they can all <coughs> hop in there and play together again at some point um, so yeah and then we took it to a little bit more of a, a competitive environment with the Fortnite camp and let me tell you these kids are better at Fortnite than I will ever be you know um, I think the the winner of the uh, Turtle Beach Pro uh, Elite 2 gaming headset had uh, 77 eliminations throughout the week, and I believe he was 13 years old. He just ran house on the rest of the camp. Yep. He, just, he, he hunted them down. <laughs> exactly, and some of the kids kind of just gave up towards the end. I mean, because he was just literally eliminating the competition. But, there you go. But yeah, he was happy, everyone was happy, and again, they learned how to work together. They learned how to talk to each other, figure out where they're going on the map, you know, and these are important skills in, in regular day life. You know, they have to. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love it when you have it in the room too, especially with Fortnite, because Fortnite can sometimes 
sometimes feel disjointed when you're playing by yourself sure. in your own house. But in the camp, they'll find themselves in the same server with each other mm-hmm. and yelling at each other across the yeah, room. Yeah, we had the, uh, the some of the matches up on the big screens, and some of them are screen peeking, trying to figure out. I'm like, hey, <laughs> get it out! I'll oh, go yeah. back to Mario Kart rules. No, no screen peeking. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, it was it was fun, you know. And we had a, a great turnout. They had a lot of fun. All the parents were happy, and all the kids were ecstatic to be able to be in our facility and gaming on those awesome machines that we have. Can't wait to do it again next summer. Yeah, and I think it's going to be probably twice as big, maybe thrice as big, dare I say. Um, but yeah, we're probably going to have thrice. to add a, a couple more camps just because of the uh, the number of kids that are going to be interested next year. But it was a blast, and I can't wait to do it again. It's just a great way to get the community involved and spread awareness of our program. That's awesome. Yep. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about Hue Fest. Yeah, so in September this year, the second annual Hue Fest, which is the Harrisburg University Esports Festival, um, will be hosted down in Harrisburg. Central PA, it's the first uh, festival of its kind to be hosted in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Started last year. This is the second year that they're doing it. Um, They... I was part of the festival. They host a tournament with 64 teams mm-hmm. coming in playing three games. Yeah, three games. Overwatch, League of Legends, and Hearthstone, I believe. Yes. Yep. So, and they invite, Amish they country. invite. Shout out to all of our Amish viewers. <laughs> <laughs> Making those chairs <laughs> that they sit in to play the games. Yeah, so it's a, it's a four day event. It's, it's basically like a, a huge esports festival slash carnival slash concert. You know, there's. Uh, a tournament that goes along with it with each game uh, over the so, course of four days yeah so it's a big it's a big deal and I believe that it is the world's largest esports event at this point just because of the number of teams that they have involved gotcha yeah and, and Hue Fest is run by Harrisburg University Chad Smeltz who was instrumental in helping us set up and start our program you know I talked to him and uh, one of his coaches for probably about three weeks straight before we even set this up and um, he's a great guy he runs a great organization down there mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's going to be an absolute blast we have two teams competing this year that's and it's i'm I'm excited to go down there especially with uh harrisburg i mean shout out to them for the the, the only athletic program they have going on is their esports program pretty impressive and and that they're going hardcore all out pedal down yep Uh, but it's 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 great that they invite us a humble little northeast pa school to to come compete with them oh yeah it's a great it's great exposure for us it's great practice for us I mean, we don't go there expecting to win by any means, but we go there hoping to get a couple W's, meet and mingle with some of these teams who've been around for a couple of years, learn from them, grow with them, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just, it's a great experience for our teams, I think. It's all about having fun in the in the program of esports, in, in having these kids work together, and then they, they end up becoming friends afterwards. It's, it's just like... Us growing up playing video games with our friends, but yeah. now it's it's just on a, a national stage. Exactly. Yep. It's going to be a beautiful time. Can't it's going to be awesome. All right. That's going to do it for today's Patch Notes. Tune in in a little bit for a little special guest interview that we have coming. Our stadium may not hold 100,000 people, but we still compete with other colleges all over the country. Giant lecture halls? Eh, that's not really for me. I like the laid back approach. Lackawanna is close to home, with satellite centers located throughout Northeastern and Central PA. Lackawanna College, helping me help you. The choice is yours to make. Changing how I learn. Changing where I learn. Changing my life. All right, welcome back. We are very excited to have with us one of our great colleagues and good friends, Someone who, again, big help to the esports program here at Lackawanna College, Dr. Chris Haskell from the esports program at Boise State. Doc, well, thanks for being here. And I think we want to start off by asking you a few questions about Boise State esports. Tell us a little bit about the facility, how it got started. You bet. We're, we're starting our third year. We're part of that second line of uh, collegiate esports uh, institutions after the Robert Morris and the UCIs and the Maryvilles. Uh, we've, uh, we're starting our third year. We have 65 varsity student athletes across five games, uh, which are League of Legends, Rocket League, Overwatch, Hearthstone, and uh, StarCraft. And we have another 300 or so students engaged at the club and academy level uh, with a bunch of other games like Rainbow Six and Call of Duty and uh, some of the other ones that uh, are not part of our varsity uh, group. But uh, we started after doing a bunch of research and and determining, oh my gosh, this thing is about to get massive. We better get started. And uh, and a couple of years later, I'm in our arena, one of uh, four spaces on campus, about 10,000 square feet of total dedicated esports space that facility is just 
gorgeous from what we could see of it. Uh, but you said you have four of them. Um, what, and this is your comp one. Could you just uh, tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about them, the space that you're in? Well, yeah. So this is the competition space, and I'll give you a little walking tour if, you, if you'll forgive me. Um, uh, I'm up here right now on our broadcast desk is where I've been chatting with you. This is where our broadcasters are in room with our, our fans. All of the production takes place right here next door in the uh, control room where we have between five and seven students who run the broadcast. Uh, and then, of course, our, our arena area where our players play on this stage. We don't have any chairs set up in here because it's the summer, but you can crash on a uh, a bean bag or, or hang out in the uh, VIP area. Or if you're a player, you're welcome to come up on this original Generation 1 blue turf and play on our, our competitive stage in front of an audience. We do about 200 hours of live broadcasting in this space every semester. So what type of facilities do you have for your practice space, your club space? So all told, we have about 110 machines uh, spread across our four different spaces. Um, anywhere from the uh, the small, uh, you know, 10-seat uh, private coach's practice room attached to my office uh, to the 24-seat um, open land center, which is the training center for for all of our students and clubs, and then the 50-seat uh, open to the public uh, land center that is uh, directly next door to this uh, location where we can uh, host big tournaments and events, uh, have the high schools play. Um, it's just a big complex. And of course, this space, the arena, the Game Pants Arena. Doc, it's one of the, the most beautiful facilities that I've ever seen, and I imagine the facilities that we can't see now are just as, as pretty. Um, but I, I wanted to move on to another question. Because Boise State is, is such a huge uh, D1 school, can you run us through some of the, the struggles or some of the benefits that you might have had in starting up the C-Sports program? Well, the and a lot of big schools will tell you, our, our colleague Kevin Reap at Missouri, um, all of the big schools coming in. The great thing about big schools is they're really powerful, but they're like a battleship. They don't turn very fast. Um, so smaller schools actually can spin up esports much quicker. Um, it is a fight to get space on campus because everybody wants space at a big institution. And so that's been that's been our biggest challenge so far is uh, identifying the space and the protocols for bringing in partnerships. Um, because a lot of times the people who are interested in supporting esports have been supporting other things. So it's kind of like uh, in in a way, you know, you, you got to ask your buddy, hey, you know, I know you guys broke up a little while ago, but you mind if uh, I give her a call? I don't want it to be weird or nothing, dude. But, um, you know, I think we've got some chemistry here. I'm talking about potential sponsorships, of course, not not people you used to date. Uh, but it is that kind of awkward uh, a little bit. It can be it can be strange if uh, if you don't. So those are just a couple of the challenges. How do we work with existing uh, partners uh, who want to support our esports student athletes? So you just mentioned some of the differences between uh, larger schools and smaller schools. Um, but then when it comes to recruiting, uh, obviously there's major differences there as well. So how how do you guys, as as one of those larger schools with the reach that you guys have? Uh, then delineate between those students that should compete in the uh, competition program and those that should maybe just join the club. We are in the process of trying to build uh, build graduates in this. So it is it is whatever is going to get us to that finish line most efficiently and with the best experience for students. Um, we had a conversation the other day. One of our um, one of our great colleagues in collegiate esports at a smaller institution. Um, we were. You know, recruiting the same high level, um, you know, grandmaster level League of Legends player. And in the end, we felt it would have been much better for this player to, to be at the other school because uh, the opportunity for success was greater. Uh, the, the way that the financial aid was structured was, was much better and the chances of graduation were much better. So we're, we're looking to recruit students not just to play for us, but who are going to play and be on our wall of fame. And the only way to make it on the wall of fame for Boise State Esports is to have a degree. Well, I know we really appreciate that as well. Um, I know you're a faculty member at Boise State. I'm a faculty member here at Lackawanna. And I know that we, with our program, have some of the same goals, trying to make better students uh, rather than just athletes. Yeah. There are lots of people that would say, well, you don't really need a college um, degree to be able to do this or that. And, and in, a, in a sense, they're right. Um, but often we are aware of the keys that that unique piece of paper uh, will give them and the doors that they'll unlock. And if that's a good match, 
um, we want to see them finish that process and be successful because it'll it'll give them benefits that they can't even imagine. Yeah, and again, I, I said this in episode one, and I'll say it here again in episode two, but the, the first and most important part of being a good student athlete is being a good student. So we, uh, we feel the same way. Um, I want to move on a little bit to the progression of collegiate esports. Now, we all know that Robert Morris was the trailblazer back in 2016 to start this whole crazy journey. Um, and now NACE has over 150 varsity programs that they're involved with. Um, where do you see the future of collegiate esports going? Can this be as big as the NCAA on a high school level? Can this surpass the Little League World Series? What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, 1869, you know, three schools, uh, three groups of students convinced their schools to let them play college football. Um, and we know how big that has grown, right? And the pyramid that it's created. I mean, 880 current college football programs from two year all the way up to D1. Uh, there are 14,049 high school programs, high school programs, uh, 48,000 uh, or so um, peewee middle school programs, right? Foot, football, it, but it's continuing to shrink. I, I think esports will be right there, especially with the, the incredible growth of, of high school esports. Um, we're over a thousand high schools now playing competitive organized esports. And uh, two years ago, I, I think that there were maybe 30 or 40 total, over a thousand. So this is going to continue to grow. There'll be a singularity moment where football, um, it'll never go away, but um, but football programs, the number of football programs will be eclipsed by the number of esports programs, club, varsity, official, whatever whatever brand they want to put on it. Now, Doc, you talked a little bit about high school esports, um, and something that we love to do here at Lackawanna College is, is set up events or tournaments or just uh, open open house parties. Uh, essentially for high schools, local high schools to come in and game and play. Uh, do you guys do anything like that at Boise State? We do. We hosted the first ever high school, statewide high school esports championships here um, a little more than a year ago. We hosted it again last year and it's a big part of what we've got planned for the for the upcoming year. A number of tournaments, a number of opportunities just to feature high schools playing other high schools. Uh, we've got this beautiful facility to have them run those events. We've got students who would love to broadcast those events. It's just a just a natural connection. Now, Doc, again, we touched uh, briefly on NACE, which is the National Association of Collegiate Esports. Uh, we've been a member for a, a little over a year now, and I know you've been a member for a while. I also know that you're uh, on the board of directors there. Um, so in your opinion, uh, how is NACE doing as an organization? How can they do better how can we attract more schools to make this as big as the NCAA? Well, this is a space that has not been well regulated historically because it's so new, because so few schools were involved, and there are no yet natural connections to these schools. Uh, Robert Morris, Utah, and Boise State, for example, and let's throw in UCI and Lackawanna, um, there are, there's, there's, no historical connection. There is no hierarchy. There is no management or uh, governance structure already in place. And NACE is looking to do that. Now, two years into their ramp up, or maybe in their third year now of ramp up, um, they're just now getting to the point with bylaws, with a board of directors, um, which I I have the pleasure of serving on, I have the <laughs> obligation of serving on. It's a, it's a great group of people. And now to put in place these professional connections, um, that everybody uh, would like to have but doesn't necessarily want an organization to do for them. For example, if, if, uh, if Teddy, I, I try to hire away that handsome bearded gentleman next to you, um, what, is the, what, is the, uh, what have we declared as appropriate, um, what's the word I'm looking for, professional practice of how I might reach out to a, uh, a person who's currently working at your institution? That's what these big organizations help us do. They help us decide uh, and then organize how we want to be colleagues. What are the rules relative to that? Because there are opportunities that people could really take advantage of. And we all see those when we get up in arms and, and grumpy about it. Um, but we need the support of a bigger community that says, no, 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 that's not okay. You got to leave that fancy bearded man right where he is. Doc, you better be careful. Don't you threaten me with a good time. <laughs> um, but... We know that uh, Boise State has a lot going on. You have uh, a lot going on. So why don't you uh, tell tell us about that? Use this as your soapbox. 
Well, we're uh, there's something always going on. Uh, you know, we this will be the first uh, first year where we've actually had the full operation set up for the entire year, and I think that that's going to make some things easier because our schedule then is not uh, is not worried. We're going to play every single one of our football opponents the same week that and basketball opponents the same week we play them in that sport so we open the football season against florida state well guess what on friday night florida state rocket league league of legends and overwatch are going to play us online um and we're going to have our fans in here so that kind of gridiron rivalry uh element of of what we do is going to be out there and and part of our schedule this year plus we're going to host a ton of other games uh, that we haven't played uh, as varsity games before and just see how they go, right? We're two years into it now. People understand what esports is. We can start to have a conversation about CSGO and we can start to have a conversation about Call of Duty as competitive activities and maybe try to separate the conversation about violence and gun violence. We're, we're at that place and we weren't for the first two years. So we, we avoided all M-rated games. We only play T-rated games and those with fantasy violence only because we don't have a gorilla, genius gorilla with a lightning gun problem on our campus. Yeah, Doc, and I think we're in a similar position as well. You know, we're coming up on our second year. Um, we have a bunch of recruits that are interested in CSGO. They ask about Call of Duty. They ask about Rainbow Six Siege. And I think it's important for us as administrators to um, teach our administration here and the parents here of the recruits that are coming in that we're swaying away from those stigmas. We're trying to uh, teach them more about the, the camaraderie and the critical thinking and strategy rather than just focusing on the, the, the gun violence and things like that. Yeah, and, and part, of, part of why we waited was because if I, if I got one conversation about esports and, and our students, it couldn't be about gun violence. So we, we left those aside, but now we're at a place where we have fans and we can and adult fans who would have been sensitive to that, we can start having the conversation and, and say, okay, well, here's really what this is about. It's about communicating position. It's about technical perfection in CSGO. Uh, and and with all of these rounds, here's what we're trying to build to by the middle rounds. And here's, here's our win condition. And let them see uh, under the hood a little bit more of these games, which are wonderful games for teaching all of these things. And they just happen to be at a level of of combat that they're not as comfortable with. We're going to test that and see if we can bring those along a little bit more because they're really valuable experiences and they give us access to students who really would benefit from the college experience with gaming being one small part of what they do. And you asked what, what we've got going. We, we're going to fill our calendar with lots and lots of low stakes opportunities for people to play. And I mean men, women, people who would not be normally as part of one of our tryouts, we're going to create a lot more experiences to just invite people into play. All right. Well, for those of you that are interested in Boise State's program and finding you and, and find what, what you guys are all about, where uh, where can they find you? Um, I, I post every once in a while on Twitter. <laughs> At Haskell. I'm so old, I actually have my own last name as my Twitter handle. All right, well, that's going to do it for today's episode of The Game Room. We want to thank, again, our supporters, uh, Game Fuel. We want to thank Dr. Chris Haskell from Boise State for helping us out and coming on and talking with us. And again, from everyone here at The Game Room, I'm Teddy. I'm Rob. And, and thank, thank you for playing. playing.